Good evening. I am Andres Mantilla. I am the director of the Department of Neighborhoods at the City of Seattle, and I wanted to thank everyone, uh, community members, participants, and, pre and presenters for joining us tonight. This town hall is a collaboration with the mayor's office as well as other various departments within the City of Seattle to bring you the most current information available. I know both the, ma the mayor and other directors joining here today are eager to hear your questions related to the COVID-19 pandemic, issues around policing, and the SPD budget and others. Uh, we want to hear your thoughts and concerns about how we can work together to build a safe and healthy community. We will begin with the mayor uh, with some opening remarks, and then we will go to uh, Director Patty Hayes, uh, and then to our Fire Chief Harold Scoggins, uh, and then uh, with our Human Service Director Jason Johnson. For any media attending, if you would like to ask questions, please reach out to the mayor's office communication staff. For residents and questions or asking questions, please type in any questions you would like to ask in the chat feature. I will do my best to accommodate as many questions as I can. I would like to take this time to remind you about the mayor's COVID-19 resource page. Uh, this is a great resource for finding all the latest updates from the city. So please visit the COVID-19 resource page at www.seattle.gov forward slash mayor forward slash COVID-19. I'm going to now pass it over to Mayor uh, Jenny Durkin to begin her remarks. Mayor. Thank you, Andres. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. I'm sorry that we can't do it in person. It's one of the difficult things about the COVID-19 crisis. I will say that our city has never faced the challenges that it's facing today. We are in the midst of a unprecedented global health pandemic that Seattle started as one of the epicenters, and now we see ourselves that it's getting worse again. That epidemic has disproportionately impacted our communities of color um, and people who have otherwise don't have resources in our city. We also know that as a result of the, the public health crisis, we've had an economic crisis as well. And tens of thousands of people in Seattle have lost their jobs. So many small businesses have had to close knowing they can never reopen. And that too has had a huge disproportionate impact on our communities of color. Amidst those two crises, which were of a, a extent that we've never had in our city, we're now in the middle of a civil rights reckoning, uh, a moment in our nation and city's history where we must address the long-term impacts, generational impacts of systemic racism um, and racism wed into our institutions. And so amidst these backdrops, we know that this is incredibly challenging time for everybody in the city of Seattle. We also know that with the pandemic, as you'll hear from Patty Hayes, that the numbers are getting bad again, and then we're gonna have to take steps in the city to try to make sure that we keep those numbers down to keep people healthy um, and to avoid the overburdening in our healthcare system. You also hear from Patty that the disproportionate impacts have gotten worse, and we really need to find ways to get into communities with trusted messengers so that people can take the steps they need to protect themselves. We in the city have moved our how we do business, not just as a city, um, but as a, as a employer. We've almost, many of our employees are also are working from home, but we've had to change our business so that very quickly we put into place things that prohibit evictions, um, also to, to move so that we could have home delivery of food for seniors who before really counted on going to senior centers and the like, not just for community, but also for a meal. We also have had to change our, our, our processes so that now we're able through our offices of uh, economic sustainability, we're delivering tens of thousands of grocery vouchers to people in Seattle who need the help. This has been a sustained effort to try to really minimize the economic impacts of the COVID virus, but we know that there's still so many people who have suffered those economic impacts. And as August 1 approaches, we know that people will be looking for ways to pay their rent or pay their mortgage. And I was on the call this week and last week imploring our federal delegation to get help in the hands of people of Seattle. So we've got a lot of challenges at this point. And one of those challenges too, is to work as a city together to reimagining policing and make sure that when someone calls for help, they get the help they need. 
I believe that we can have a new path forward for Seattle so that if someone calls 911, if they need a police officer, they will get one very quickly. But often they need a different kind of help. They may need a social worker or someone who has uh, experience in crisis intervention. We want to build up that capability and to do so, we really are going to have to rely on community based organizations who are already doing this work, know what community needs, know how communities need to heal. We also have to make unprecedented investments into our black community and communities of color. We need people to have what they need so that they have affordable housing, access to good health care, true educational opportunity and justice and true economic justice. All of these things, I think we can work forward, move forward together as a city. Um, none of it will be easy, but I look forward to working with everybody in, in South Seattle and to continuing to listen to people on what they need from me as a mayor, but also what we need to do as a city to get us through these three challenges um, so that when we come out the end of COVID-19, we come back not to the status quo, not to business as usual, but we've really made things better. We've improved equity and we've changed how we can do policing, but also so that there is true economic um, opportunity for everyone in Seattle. It's wrong that a kid growing up in South Park has such a shorter life expectancy than a kid growing up in Laurelhurst. I believe we can do better as a city and I look forward to working with you and people throughout the city to make that possible. Thank you, Mayor. We're going to turn now to uh, Director Patty Hayes uh, from Seattle King County Public Health. Good evening, everybody, and I'm so delighted to be here with you tonight and give you an update. As the mayor said, we're facing just unprecedented times here with a global pandemic and with uh, King County being where the epicenter started and we continue to work our way through. I want to give you a, a brief update tonight on the status of the outbreak uh, as well as some of the, the priority areas we're working uh, to get um, uh, both the strategies out in your area as well as supporting the community. But I do want to start by just reminding everybody that this pandemic uh, is uh, something that of course, none of us have experienced. And indeed, what makes a pandemic is of three things. First of all, it's a novel virus. It's a virus that none of us have experienced. So our bodies don't have the immunity for it. it at one point, uh, COVID was likened to be the flu, and we know clearly that that is not true. It's a member of the coronavirus family but it has very unique components that we're learning about live time. In the very beginning of this outbreak, we did not know that it could be transmitted before you even had symptoms, and now we know that. So please know that when you see messaging being tweaked or changing just a little bit, it's because we're learning more about the virus. The second component is uh, we don't know all the best treatments. Now, over the last five months that we've been in this, we've learned a lot about how, how treatment can help, but there's not a universal treatment for COVID yet. And then lastly, there's no vaccine, and you've seen a lot of, that, of the chatter about that nationally. We hope that there will be a vaccine, uh, hopefully next year. But until that time, the only things that we have to really arm ourselves with this are the things that are just exhausting to all of us, which is we need to uh, to wear face coverings. We, we need to, to physically distance when we're around other people. We need to limit our interactions with people. It is so important, even though the weather's nice and we all want to be outside, we've got to work on these core strategies because this virus is relentless and it does not take a day off. So one of my main messages is to you is to ask for your partnership to really keep uh, working. And if you are ill, please stay home. Uh, we are seeing the COVID numbers, they have quadrupled. 
since we began uh, to open the economy a little bit, and this is the problem in a pandemic. We know people need to get back to work. We know how traumatizing it is to be isolated. And yet, the minute we opened the economy, we knew the spread would happen. So our numbers since uh, early June uh, have quadrupled. And there, as you will see on the screen here, is the set of key indicators that we update on a weekly basis. And these are the metrics we have with the governor. There is the website noted down at the bottom of the slide that I would encourage you all to go to. It has our different data dashboards. This is one of the dashboards. We post a dashboard every day with the current numbers and it has uh, a toggle by geography uh, component on it so that you can literally look in South Seattle and look at the numbers. So one of the questions I get a lot is, well, where is the outbreak happening? When it first started, as you know, it was in a nursing home. And since that time, we've had outbreaks happening in different places. But right now in our work, we're finding that there is uh, pretty much community exposure going on. It's household transmission. It's essential workers that have to be out and about. The community transmission, because people are out at gatherings, they are going out to restaurants, they are having backyard barbecues. Um, so the, it, it's really difficult to uh, investigate back to exactly where these outbreaks are happening. We're having some uh, in different areas all around the county, but it is particular particularly strong South Seattle into South King County. And what we do know is that our BIPOC communities, our communities of color are particularly disproportionately impact as the mayor has stated. This relates to the vulnerability because of longstanding uh, problems that affect the BIPOC community's health with more uh, health conditions, chronic conditions and the uh, need to uh, not, the inability to work from home and various, various problems that, that are uh, longstanding in those communities. We have a very strong focus on a key number of stat strategies that include the elements uh, that I just mentioned that you all can help me with, but also we are expanding our testing we are uh, working in a great partnership you're going to hear about from Chief Scoggins with the Seattle to make testing more available in and around Seattle. We're continuing to expand that and looking at new areas where we don't believe that the access uh, is great enough and getting more out because we want people who, uh, the priority for testing is of course, if you're an essential worker, if you have been exposed or if you're having symptoms, all those things are really important to get testing. The second thing is uh, contact tracing. For every case that we learn about, when a COVID test comes back, public health is notified. And between uh, the department here in King County and the State Department of Health, we contact uh, th those individuals and ask who all their contacts were and then contact all those people. So if someone was at a workplace or went to a restaurant or went to a, a wedding reception or went to a barbecue, we ask for those names to follow up with all those folks so that they can take care of themselves, so they can isolate themselves and get themselves tested. We're also working to support uh, community well-being and mental health. This, this pandemic has a, a grave impact uh, on, a, on our generation right now with uh, the uh, isolation that folks feel, uh, the inability for things to feel normal, and just all the change. So this is a particular concern that we're working with the city on. So again, I would ask you all to partner with me to please wear face coverings, particularly when you're not able to physically distance, but um, 
I'm in my home right now. I'm not wearing one right now, but the minute I go outside, I put mine on. To please keep yourself six feet away from people, to always do uh, hand hygiene uh, frequently, and then if you are not feeling well, please stay home. We want to get through this together. And with that, Andreas, I'll give it back to you. Thank you, Director Hayes. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, our fire chief, Chief Scoggins, Chief. Hello, good evening, everyone. And thank you for taking the time to join us this evening. I just briefly want to talk about our COVID-19 testing sites that, that we have stood up here in the city of Seattle. And as Director Hayes just um, mentioned, you know, we're really focusing on um, trying to keep, keep the curve flat and trying to reduce the number of exposures because we know that's what's going to make a healthy community. If you haven't heard, we've stood up two COVID-19 testing sites one in Soto and one on Aurora. And you can sign up for COVID-19 testing at seattle.gov forward slash COVID-19. Uh, you don't, this is a, one, these sites, you don't, you don't need to pay for the test to be done. We just wanna make sure you get tested if you're exhibiting signs and symptoms of COVID-19. And we wanna make sure that you're in a position to take um, care of yourself if you are exposed to COVID-19. So that's what these sites are for. You know, our firefighters have been working hard over the last several months um, to help flatten the curve here in Seattle. And we've really been doing a lot of testing. We've tested our own first responders. We've tested in long-term care facilities. And now we're testing in, at these community testing sites. And we hope to expand that in the coming weeks. And we're really looking forward to that. I do want to send a reminder out to the community that if you are experiencing uh, chest pain, signs and symptoms of a stroke or respiratory distress, I do want to encourage you to call 911 so we can get there and show up and get you to where you need to be to get the best care possible. During the COVID experience, we have seen a decrease in the people calling in, in the number of people calling 911 for heart related issues and stroke related issues and severe respiratory distress. So I really want to encourage you um, to continue to call 911 so our medics can get there and help you out and get you to a facility where you can get that definitive care. That's all I have, Andreas. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we'll turn it over to Jason Johnson from uh, Human Services Department. Jason. Thank you and good evening. Uh, my name is Jason Johnson and I have the honor of serving as the director of the City of Seattle Human Services Department. HSD's uh, mission is to ensure individuals, families, and communities are safe, healthy, and have their basic needs met. Uh, racial equity is our foundational value as we conduct this important work. This evening, I wanted to provide two quick updates on behalf of the dedicated mission-driven employees of the Human Services Department. First, on the city's work to address homelessness. The city has created and continues to maintain safer shelter space throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. Since the COVID crisis started in late February, early March, we created roughly 400 new beds to redistribute people from high-density congregate shelter settings to shelter beds at Seattle Center uh, through use of the Exhibition Hall and Fisher Pavilion, as well as at Parks Community Centers, at the Southwest Teen Life Center, Garfield Community Center, and Miller Community Center, and through the use of hotels. The city opened 95 new spaces at uh, via tiny home villages and enhanced shelters in North Seattle and in the Central District. We did this work in strong partnership with public health uh, King County Department of Community and Human Services, and in partnership with many community-based organizations. As a result, COVID-19 transmissions have been flat at city-supported shelter programs since implementing these important programmatic changes, even while we see increases in the general population. Robust testing is in place at shelters, hygiene centers, day centers, permanent supportive housing buildings, and other other homeless service sites. We will continue to monitor the spread of COVID-19 and have isolation, quarantine, and recovery sites uh, capacity available if conditions change for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Next slide. Uh, the Human Services Department invests over $18 million annually to promote family support, youth development, 
employment and safety programs. We focus our services on community-based programs and projects that drive positive results for Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and other communities of color in Seattle. We can only do this because of the partnerships we have with community-based organizations, nonprofit agencies and their leaders, with other city departments, and because of a strong commitment by HSD staff. In 2019, HSD released a safety RFP. Activities funded by this RFP focus on 18 to 24 year olds harmed by the criminal legal system in Seattle. As a result of the RFP, along with other related contracts, HSD is investing over $6 million in safety focused programming this year. Some highlights from that uh, safety portfolio uh, is uh, community critical incident response. Uh, HSD has committed $300,000 in 2020 toward a critical uh, community critical incident response program to prevent and de-escalate potential incidents. In communication with Seattle Police Department uh, regarding when and where critical incidences may occur, the designated community-based uh, organization, in this case, Community Passageways, uh, will immediately activate to hospitals and potential hotspots to calm tensions. They will also coordinate with community leaders who can regularly follow up with families of victims and perpetrators and leverage community's knowledge about ongoing conflicts. Community critical incident response priority population is uh, youth, young adults who are gang involved in the criminal legal system or involved in incidents of community violence. I also wanted to highlight uh, the Youth Consortium. This is a program that introduces youth and young adults 15 to 25 to civic engagement. Uh, by investing in the Youth Consortium, HSD expects to prevent community crime by empowering youth and young adults to work together in a youth-led leader. American-led community-based organizations are contracted to lead this work. Create Justice, Rainier Beach Action Coalition, and Community Passageway. The third program that I wanted to highlight is uh, Reentry, Rerouting Indigenous Community Healing. In partnership with the Seattle Office of Civil Rights, we are investing in two Native uh, community-led organizations to provide Native indigenous specific community healing practices for individuals re-entering community from prison. $250,000 uh, has been made available starting July 1st this year uh, through December 31st of 2022. Uh, Chief Seattle Club and Un Kitewa are the um, contracted providers for this important work. HSD is hard at work supporting the city's most vulnerable communities especially critical during the COVID pandemic. We are available if you have any questions, but more importantly, if you need help, uh, you can find a lot more information about the services um, that the Human Services Department manages through uh, www.seattle.gov forward slash human services. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Jason. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Chris Fisher from the Seattle Police Department to speak next. Chris. Thank you, Andres. Um, and thank you everybody for having me, Mayor, for pulling this together. Sorry, Chief Best, we had an urgent uh, issue pop up. I'm sure there'll be some news about it later, um, but I'm filling in. And so really what she wanted to focus on today um, was how important it is to keep having these conversations, even in the midst of COVID. Um, she's been trying to go out to these both small in-person meetings, socially distanced, of course, uh, continue to participate in these online forums, and we've been doing some community walks that we're going to continue, especially as we have this beautiful weather. Uh, but really just wanting to hear from the community about what their issues are, what they want community safety to look like. Um, and so that's been really important. So these opportunities are uh, a good part of that for the police department in respect to COVID. Uh, when these cases started popping up and we were the epicenter, as the mayor pointed out, we worked with the fire department to really ensure we had first responders um, having access to testing so we could keep them safe and the people they serve safe. That was a great partnership with the fire department. And we continue to prioritize that now as we see some of the resurgence. We've 
re-stood up all of our systems and never really went away to make sure we're monitoring uh, what's happening uh, with our workforce and keeping everybody available and well. So then the chief also wanted to update specifically for this town hall and the communities that are here tonight about what went over this weekend. Um, so on Saturday, as most people are aware, there was a large demonstration that began peacefully. Uh, and then a few hours later, uh, turned into more of a protest and some violence. There was arson and property destruction, some looting um, and some projectiles, some of which were uh, explosive in nature thrown at officers. There was even a device that blew a hole in the wall of these precinct. Uh, in the end, we had 59 officers hurt, two required additional treatment at Harborview. And there were also, of course, some individuals uh, hurt as well in the crowd. That's something the chief has stressed to everyone. We don't want to see that. Uh, but it's her responsibility under the city charter to keep people and property safe. And when this demonstration clearly became a riot, uh, then SPD had to step in and engage the crowd and try to regain control. Um, and the chief also, I won't speak for her on this because I think it's a history she has that she can speak more specifically to, but we all know where the community is right now. We understand the pain and the feeling that people are experiencing and protesting against. Systemic racism has an ugly history in so many aspects of American life, healthcare, education, public service, public safety, and the, the murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor really have awoken everyone. And I think it's keeping everyone up at night. Um, and it's something we all want to see positive change come out of such tragedy and tragedies that have really been going on for 400 years. Um, and also, you know, I think the chief would say, that change is why she became an officer 28 years ago and why most of the officers, I would think almost all of them on the department signed up. They want to make change. They want to help their community, their parents, their children, their spouses, their partners, their community leaders, their immigrants, and something inspired them to want to serve their community by being a police officer. And most of that was making a difference and helping people. So the Seattle Police Department um, once changed too, but we want to have that change through conversation, not violent protest. We know that protest has been a source of change throughout history, but also so is meaningful, purposeful conversation. And it may be time to move towards that. Uh, and those conversations are already happening. We're engaged in those community conversations around re-envisioning community safety. And the SPD is committed to meaningful community-led work about what this looks like. It's not a new concept, and we've all heard the chief and the mayor and others say this over and over again, but it's true that officers have been asked to pick up too many pieces from failed systems. And if we could better support and better manage those systems, officers will have less to do. They can focus on those truly emergency situations where the training and the skills and the tools that officers have are what makes a difference. Until that work happens, however, officers are going to need to be able to respond to help people and to protect people. Uh, it's not going to be uh, from one day to the next. There's going to have to be building up of capacity and training and transition. And that's really, I think, where the conversation is headed and where we want to be a main part of that conversation. Uh, Chief is definitely aware of some strong reactions uh, that have occurred as we've tried to explain what would happen if the department was quickly cut by 50%. It would be a large scale layoff. Um, fortunately, it seems, though we're waiting to see uh, this week as council debates their amendments, what it will look like. But it seems like maybe that drastic cut is no longer in the cards, but we're really preparing every day for how to respond to different budget realities to make sure that we can continue to provide essential public safety services to the city. The chief's commitment is really focusing on our 911 response. We have to have the ability to get to in progress crimes, life safety issues as fast as possible. Our goal is seven minutes in those in progress life safety incidents. We are often there faster than that. Um, and that's really where the focus is and where the focus will be and we'll figure everything else out from there. Um, so today and moving forward, I think these opportunities are important to the chief. She really did want to be here tonight. I spoke to her just a, a few hours before this, um, that she was looking forward to doing it, uh, but this issue popped up. But she does want to hear, and we all want to hear what community safety looks like um, for the people uh, of Seattle. And so, you know, the broad policy and budget conversations, that's what happens in City Hall. Uh, the chief and the department really want to hear what people want today, tomorrow, the next day, what, what you want it to look like um, for those who live here, work here, and make the city great. Um, so I'll leave it there. I'm sure there'll be some questions, and I'll do my best to answer those. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, we're going to go into the uh, question and answer period of the agenda. As a reminder, 
Um, please continue to put your questions in the chat box. We have quite a bit of questions, so I'm going to try my best to group them together into like uh, themes. Uh, as a reminder, this is also being recorded and will be available uh, on Seattle Channel in the coming days. So the first uh, question uh, for Mayor Durkin, and maybe Chris, you want to add to it. Um, what is the mayor's office's plan uh, or or what do they plan to do around the calls around defunding SPD? Um, some called by 50 percent. And how does that connect to the commitment, Mayor, that you've made to invest $100 million uh, over the, in BIPOC communities over the next 10 years? Thank you, Andres. So um, I think there's two parts to the divest and invest and sitting down with community and talking to various uh, communities and leaders from the black community is that one, there's a whole issue around policing. And what people want to see is that our police response changes and that the communities actually get the help they need. So I want to talk about that separately. Um, and the second is that we, we have, we have underinvested in the black community and community of colors um, as a city and as a nation. And that if we, truly want to provide more equity, we have to do a massive um, uh, reconfiguration of those investments so that I, I personally believe that public safety um, comes first by people having what they need. Um, and that means access to affordable housing. It means that they have uh, economic justice so that they truly can get the same opportunities as other people in Seattle. It means good health care and child care. It makes an education justice. We are about to approach another year where we're going to have uh, no in-person learning uh, in our Seattle public schools. So today I talked with Denise Juno about how we can ensure that the, the kids who are already been left behind by our education system and the very real opportunity gap we have between kids of color, particularly black kids and, and white kids, how do we make sure that they, we don't have another year where that we, they've lost education? So there's a range of issues that I think we have to do to show our commitment to community, to invest in those things that are the primary thing that makes any community safe. The second part is really reimagining a police department so that when someone calls 911, they get the help they need. Uh, we have seen um, over many decades that now police respond to any range of calls that really are a reflection of where things have broken down in society and other institutions have not been in place to do the jobs they need. For example, last year, the Seattle Police Department responded to almost 17,000 crisis calls, 17,000 crisis calls. We need to build a system in place so that fewer people have to call in the first place and they get the help that they need in the community. We saw a great defunding of mental health um, in the, uh, over the last few decades, so that we need to build up a community response so that people are getting first and foremost what they need in community. But then when they don't, when they call 911, what are those jobs that we don't need police to be doing? We can have other people respond. And how do we build up the capacity? It will look different for different communities across the city. Um, but what the idea is, if someone calls 911 24-7 um, a day, you want somebody to be able to respond and respond immediately. So really re-envisioning that kind of policing. You know, we did a public health response just uh, about two years ago, and Chief Scoggins might want to address it. You know, we came in, when I came in, we saw time after time, we saw police were being called to people experiencing mental health or other behavioral health crises. Um, downtown, often people who were uh, also people experiencing homelessness. People would call 911, a police officer be dispatched. When a police officer arrives at that situation, if a crime hasn't occurred, they have very little options. They can either take the person to Harborview Hospital or another hospital place, or if a crime has occurred, they arrest them and take them to jail. Neither one of those is a good public health intervention, nor is it successful in getting that person what they need um, and so we started what's called Health One. So instead of a police officer going to those cases, we now have a trained medic and a social worker working for the fire department. It's had great success in being able to reach people, get them stabilized, connect them with housing or shelter or with their case managers. We need that same kind of public health harm reduction model 
for such an a range of cases. To do that, we're going to have to build up the capacity of, and we have it, you know, we, Jason Johnson talked about some of the organizations like Community Passageways and others. There's Choose 180, Rainier Beach Action Coalition, who know and have ties to community. So we need to build that capacity quickly, and we need to build it so that 24-7, we can have the kind of response that people need. On the funding itself, um, Chief Best and I have made very clear that we don't believe you can have a drastic cut of 50% this year or next without impairing community safety for everybody. Um, almost all of the vast majority of Seattle Police Department's expenses are in personnel. So to make those cuts, you would be cutting the number of police officers. And that we believe would not enhance public safety. The chief has been with this department for 30 years. Um, she has a deep sense uh, and tie to the community and wants to make sure that as we reimagining policing, we do get a different kind of response possible. But she also has an obligation to make sure that she can provide a true public safety in every part of our city uh, around the clock. Um, and that's why uh, when we talk about um, the cuts, we propose very specific types of cuts both to the budget itself, but also to the work that SPD does. If we're going to reimagine what policing is, we need the department to also reflect that. And there's some jobs in the department that don't need to be connected to law enforcement, like the 911 call center or parking enforcement officers, a range of things like that. So we look forward to working with and collaborating with the city council and continue to hear from community. We hear from people every day about this really important issue in the city of Seattle. Chris, do you want to add anything to that? I think the mayor touched on most of it. I just we are doing and in some of this we've presented uh, in front of council a, a deep dive on all of those call types and really examining the ones that clearly need a police officer. There's a, an active crime in progress and for safety reasons and because of you know municipal and state code, the only person who can resolve some of those issues is a law enforcement officer. And then we're looking at the ones where a partnership or, or a complete handoff makes sense. And then we're also in a lot of these community conversations, really focusing on making sure people are aware of the hard work the department has been doing for the past uh, 10 or so years under the consent decree. A lot of the, the reforms that are being discussed nationally, SPD is done. Um, there's much, as Chief always says, it's continuous improvement and innovation. We, we're not done doing reform, but a lot of stuff that a lot of other, other cities need to do, at Seattle's done because of the great leadership of the community and of people in government um, and people in these departments. And so we're just also making sure people know what is happening and also where we want the department to go. But as Chief has said over and over again, we've had those conversations internally before. And I think now is this opportunity to, to really realize them and see is now the time where there is the impetus to make some of these significant changes that really haven't been made in most places anywhere. And now's the time for Seattle to continue to show that we really can show the nation like what modern policing and community safety look like. Hey Andreas, if I can just add in real quick about Health One. Yeah, go ahead Chief. You know, I'm so proud of the work that our firefighters are doing out there serving the community. And this resource Health One with our uh, firefighter EMTs and our social worker it is really paying off for the community. And, and these firefighters and our social worker, when they respond to someone on the street, they're not in a rush. They take the time they need to find out what the people need. If people need a ride to shelter, they get them that. If people need, um, a phys if, if they need an appointment at a healthcare clinic, they help them get that appointment. And then um, if they need a ride, they'll give them a ride. If people need food, we find them a way to get them food. Um, our goal is to meet people where they are and to get people what they need. And the key piece to our, our Health One program is our follow-up. Everyone that we uh, make a contact with on the street and we get them to wherever it is, wherever it is they need to be, we actually do the follow up behind it to make sure they're stabilized and getting the care that they need to to really keep them off the streets and to keep them in a good place. So I'm really proud of the work that they do each and every day. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. Um, I'm going to go back to Chris here. Um, how will SBD change the ways they engage with protesters 
to ensure the safety of both the people involved in these actions and the people and property around them. All right, thanks, Andres. So we, the command team is having those conversations daily um, from the first day that this current period really started, just a, a few days after the murder of George Floyd on uh, May 29th. Um, we, from that moment forward, where some of some things obviously didn't go as we would have liked them to go, and things went as we trained for, the chief reached out to the Center for Policing Equity, led by Dr. Phil Goff, a renowned expert in sort of examining the the policies and practices of police departments that in, in endure racism and disparate impacts, and for them to come and really look at what happened that first weekend to make some recommendations and to really review what went wrong and what could go better and where we should change our policies. And so we're going to be considering their feedback. Chief also is a, mem a board member and on uh, the chair of the Human and Civil Rights Committee for the International Association of Chiefs of Police. And she asked them to convene, and I think some other chiefs around the country did, they convened an international collection, the, ne the Netherlands, France, Belgium, Canada, America, a couple uh, cities across our country to really talk about what are they seeing, what strategies have helped, because the challenge that, and I'm not an operational person, but the challenge, to, the way I understand it, is traditionally, you know, we've, there are over 300 demonstrations a year in Seattle, and the police department goes to about 70 of those, and in the past, May Day was probably the most um, energetic and maybe a few others, but what was different recently was very large peaceful crowds with a few, um, depending on the day, a few to a couple hundred uh, individuals and also focused on engaging in destruction and violence. And it, it, is, it was a challenge to address those individuals in a broader crowd. And from talking to folks as the chief has, there's no clear tools or approach that people are aware of other than some tools that other countries might use that I, I don't think are an option here in the US. Uh, but we're continuing to have those conversations. We're continuing to, you know, if, as Chief has said, to meet peace with peace. I think Sunday, this past, just yesterday, was I think everything pretty much was relatively smooth and, and peaceful, and there wasn't uh, any, much of an engagement at all. But when things escalate, as the Chief has said, she can't have officers stand by while, you know, property and people are put at severe risk. And it's really a call each day that those events are happening about when is it um, reasonable to go in and address the situation. But we're having those conversations daily about how to minimize the footprint and minimize the engagement with, you know, out sort of letting things get out of hand. Thanks, Chris. Um, Mayor, uh, COVID-19 has created uh, economic hardship uh, for a lot of communities. There's a question around uh, specifically the Southeast and Central communities, um, BIPOC and, and communities of color. What is the city doing to uh, uh, support small businesses to prevent evictions um, and to support individuals? Thanks, Andres. We've been trying to do a range of things, both what the city's doing and then in, in partnership either with the county or the state and sometimes with our federal partners. So first and foremost, we, we saw early that we knew that this uh, economic hardship was going to hit small businesses and workers the hardest. Uh, we saw that when the businesses in downtown and South Lake Union sent their workers home to, to work from home, immediately the small businesses in and around that area started to close for lack of customers. So we quickly changed our model and tried to ascertain what we could do to give direct relief to both businesses and individuals. Many people may not realize, but the Washington State Constitution prohibits a city from giving a gift of public funds. So there are very, li there are very limited circumstances in which we can just give money to individuals. So we worked with the, with the Attorney General, gave some advice to cities that relax that. And we worked hard to find those funds that we could do. So number one, we said we were going to stop evictions. Um, we did. I'm going to be extending that order. I have to work with city council and, and Pete Holmes and the governor to make sure that it is consistent with what the governor's doing. But we want to make sure that as COVID continues, people don't become homeless and lose their, their place to live. Two, we will continue our very successful program to give people grocery vouchers so that they can get their own food and shop for their food. And in, in, in addition to the other food programs that we have, we've, ex, we've uh, increased our food to food banks and our support of food banks. We're also working with outside partners in philanthropy and business to help with 
uh, rent relief to be able to get people direct money so they can pay their rent, as well as to, is to increase the amounts for food stability. So we're working really hard to focus on that. And we've seen that not only are uh, a, a large part of these resources end up going to communities in, in South Seattle, because that's where the need is the greatest, but they end up to, is to increase the amounts for food stability. So we're working really hard to focus on that. And we've seen that not only are uh, a, a large part of these resources end up going to communities in, in South Seattle, because that's where the need is the greatest, but they end up uh, going to communities uh, that are either uh, black communities or other communities of color. Uh, and our, our data shows that we're a spot closer to uh, South Park and those areas that we know that there has been, particularly in the Latinx community, the numbers are just shocking in terms of the disproportionate impact. And so getting both education to those communities so that we can start to bring the, the, the disease transmission down, but the support that people need through that, um, whether it is shelter, access to food, um, so we are going to be continuing a, a number of strategies to both meet what people need fundamentally just to survive. But then as we start rebuilding this economy and recovering, we're really focusing our recovery on the same communities to make sure that as we come out of this again, that we build a more equitable economy. The next question might be for uh, Chief Scoggins and Patty. Um, what is the plan given the uh, cases that we're seeing to expand uh, free testing in South Seattle and Central Seattle? Uh, sure, I'll lead. Um, the mayor just touched on it briefly. We're working hard to identify locations to expand uh, free community testing in South Seattle and, and also in West Seattle. Hopefully by the end of the week, we'll be able to announce that more to the community, but we're really excited about the work that's going on here in Seattle. Director hey, Hayes. Andres, Andres, one thing I would add is, one thing community can help us on is, we still, we need to be able to, the rise that we're seeing in cases in most of Seattle and King County is in young people, but then it moves pretty quickly to other vulnerable populations or older people. And in the Latinx community, we're seeing it dispersed uh, throughout the ages. So we really need help, you know, with the things like wearing face coverings. If you're with a community-based organization, we have the ability to help provide you face coverings so that you can be the ones reaching into community. Um, there's a limit to what both language barriers and cultural barriers, well, people might not listen to Jenny Durkin or Patty Hayes, but they will listen to their trusted partners from the community. So we really need to work with you more um, and hear from you. Patty Hayes has a whole group and I'll let her comment on that, on how trying to get into trusted community partners so that we can get both the education people need to reduce transmission, but as importantly, the help they need um, should someone get sick. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Um, so as Chief Scoggin said, uh, the great work with the fire department uh, to expand testing is underway. We continue to assess where there are gap areas that we need to expand testing and work uh, with the city on that. In addition, we're working to put more testing in South King County as well. And as the mayor said, we're partnering to hire community health workers and uh, folks from the community as navigators to help our team, not only to help work with community on the issues that they face and the challenges uh, with the services they need or their challenges with isolating themselves during the, the potential transmission period. So these are strategies that all have to work together to keep us safe. And I uh, appreciate uh, the pitch again for the basic things we need to do with face coverings and uh, physical distancing, hygiene, and staying home when we're not feeling well. Thank you, Patty. Uh, this question is for the mayor. What has COVID-19 meant uh, for the city budget for 2020 and into 21 and 22? And then what is the city doing to partner with state and federal governments? So COVID-19 has 
been devastating for the city's budget, just as it's been devastating for the for the budgets of so many people in Seattle and so many small businesses. We have a, about a $300 million hole in our budget for 2020, and we're projecting that the, the hole for next year, 2021, will be as big. Um, we were able to see this coming a little bit as soon as we saw that COVID was coming and we saw the extent of damage in other countries. We worked really quickly, um, and I ordered a freeze in hiring. We cut back certain expenses. We uh, managed to get some language into the first federal act so that the city of Seattle would get money directly for relief for COVID. We also were able to um, conserve some of our rainy day money and our emergency money so that we were able to this year to pr really protect those services that people need. The last thing I wanna be doing as mayor is to cut services to the very people who are already impacted the most. Uh, next year, we'll have a similar challenge because the, the budget hole is big. And so we're gonna work very, very hard to protect those services to the people who need them the most. It's gonna re it may require a number of layoffs or furloughs from city employees. Uh, we will get a forecast in about two weeks that tell us what we have to budget against. Under the law, we basically get a forecast and it says, here's how much money we think you're going to get and our budget has to match that. So we're in a very difficult time in the city, but I'm working very hard to see, to make sure that we minimize the impacts on the communities who've already been so disproportionately hit, both by the health impacts of COVID and by the economic impacts. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I know that you um, have to leave at around six. Uh, so I wanna just offer um, that other directors will stay on past that time. Mayor, do you want any closing remarks on your end? I just want to say that, again, these are unprecedented times and we are facing a, a, a three big challenges that no city has ever faced at one time before. And uh, for Seattle, being in the middle of this health pandemic of unprecedented nature, two, the economic devastation that it's wreaked, and three, being in the middle of this very important civil rights reckoning. And I know that no one mayor is going to by herself undo generations of systemic racism and inequity. But I can also tell you that we will work as hard as we can to make change now and to make it generational change. We will be continue to listen um, with community, work with community to see not just how we reimagine policing, but how we reimagine how we govern, how we make sure we make investments in every part of the city so every community has what it needs for true community health and wellness. This is a process that will take time working together. We won't change things overnight, but we have an obligation to start now. And I have been making changes, working with Chief Best and other people across our departments to see what changes we can make immediately and how we make the other changes over time together with community so that we can make sure that those changes are durable and lasting and really do benefit the generations of Seattle in the future. I wanna thank you all for taking the time to be here. I look forward to when we can meet in person again. Take care. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm gonna go next to Chris here. Um, Chris, a lot of questions around uh, some of the rulings that happened this weekend around less lethal force. Um, uh, can you give some clarification as to what does that all mean and what transpired uh, over the weekend? Sure, Andres, I'll try. I'm, I'm not a lawyer, um, but I will dance around the edges and we can get specific answers from a lawyer. Um, my understanding is the, the federal judge, Judge Robar, on, on Friday night, late Friday night, uh, stayed the, the city council ordinance uh, banning the possession and use of most of our less lethal tools uh, because the Department of Justice uh, had raised the concern that it went against the process of the consent decree and would leave officers with minimal tools that might lead to an increase in use of force, which was the very reason why they came in uh, at the start of the consent decree. Uh, it did leave Judge Jones's temporary restraining order in effect, uh, which is in line with our policy anyway. Um, it, it, the only one of my understandings of the key difference is it, it places the use of, of CS or tear gas needing the chief's approval. Um, and the chief made it clear that the, the federal judges stay of the council ordinance, she was not going to approve the use of tear gas over the weekend. Um, and so officers were allowed to use pepper spray 
and, and blast balls if they need it to under our policy guidelines that were developed with the court as part of the consent decree. Um, and as we've stated all along, if even this weekend there's anything that looked like it did not go according to training, that will be referred to OPA and they'll investigate all of those as they're investigating um, all the incidents over the past uh, two months or so. So that, that was generally where we stand. Our understanding is the judge's stay was for 14 days, and I think there'll be continued conversations between the parties about what happens at the end of those 14 days. Thank you, Chris. A, a question again for you here is, um, there's, there's a couple of questions as to why some SPD officers are wearing uh, masks and why others aren't. Can you clarify uh, department policy on that if you, if you can? Yeah, I mean, the chief has made it clear that masks are expected and a uh, chain of command has to deal with any officer who is not wearing um, either their surgical or cloth mask. Um, and, you know, I, I believe I'd have to double check on this, but if there's if someone is repetitively had to be told um, that would be, you know, going against their chain of command and that could become an OPA issue. But um, the OPA director didn't I don't thought did not think my understanding is that an initial not wearing a mask was an OPA issue. Um, but if you were repetitively told to and didn't comply, but the chief has made it clear in multiple communications that people need to have their mask on. Um, you know, there are circumstances where if they're, I think, you know, he heavily riding a bike in terms of respiration, that might be um, an exception. I'm not completely sure on that, but they are they are expected to wear their mask if at all possible, is my understanding. Uh, thank you. Next question uh, for Patty. Uh, Patty, there's some questions here around uh, either f folks with uh, English as a second language or undocumented uh, folks. Uh, and their ability to access testing. Can you give some clarification uh, as it relates to that? So I'm not um, uh, sure. So uh, we do uh, have uh, bilingual um, navigators and community health workers that can help. Uh, if folks need it at the testing site, it should be available at the provider offices, uh, and plus we have all our materials in multiple languages. So if um, that's a problem, we need to hear about it. So we uh, would encourage uh, any stories of problems to be sent in uh, so that we can look at it, Andreas. Thank you. A follow-up to that is um, given the spikes in cases, there's a question around uh, how effective contract tracing even is in the future anymore. Uh, can you comment on that? So contact tracing is clearly a core public health approach. We use it with all of our diseases. It's particularly challenging uh, because of the unique nature of the COVID outbreak, but it does make sure, particularly if we can get to the contacts of individuals so that we're helping secure families. We're able to talk with uh, employers and others. It really allows us to reach in. So even though I know there's been a discussion, particularly on the national level, about some of the challenges to following up because of the delays in other places with testing, and we've had some delays here, nothing like what's happened around other parts of the country, but we're really working to make sure the labs that we're using are able to process tests uh, and get us the information. That's one, one thing about contact tracing is that it's just one part of the strategies that I've outlined. It's very important. It allows us to, to check to check with people to see how they're doing. And we are able to work with individuals and their families who have been exposed or are symptomatic so that if their symptoms start getting worse, we're able to get them into care or we can uh, get help people need. So the core work of contact tracing will continue. There's going to be bumps in the road um, because of what we're learning about this virus and because of the capacity that hasn't been available um, because of the lack of federal response in some areas. But we're, uh, we're moving forward in hiring more folks so that we can be responsive to the numbers wherever they lie. Thank you, Patty. Um, Jason, I'm gonna go to a question for you. Um, 
can you speak to what the city's policies are uh, currently on uh, working with homeless and houseless uh, individuals, specifically in the removal of any sort of camps? Sure, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so since the uh, beginning of the COVID crisis, uh, we have uh, ceased all uh, uh, encampment removal operations unless there has been a uh, you know severe uh, criminal or public health element uh, in in the in the encampment. But the uh, usual um, uh, accessibility blockage, uh, uh, tents in a park, tents in a right of way, uh, we are uh, ensuring that there are connections for those individuals. We have our navigation team as well as contracted uh, outreach workers who uh, make connections to individuals, uh, offer services, uh, including shelter, encourage people to uh, uh, come indoors where they can have access to services, um, and uh, also have done uh, a lot of work to get hygiene supplies and COVID information uh, out to individuals experiencing homelessness. But at this time, uh, we had, um, you know, in alignment with public health and alignment with CDC, uh, have really uh, ceased all uh, encampment removal operations and uh, instead are uh, really trying to connect with uh, every individual we can. Uh, given the limits of the number of people on the navigation team and the number of people on a variety of different outreach teams, but really uh, trying to in, in, engage with as many people as we can, connecting those individuals to the services they need. Thank you, Jason. Um, another question for you is, given uh, the many seniors that are perhaps uh, experiencing social and physical isolation. What is the city and human service <clears throat> department uh, doing to provide services to senior uh, populations? Yeah, it's 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 really difficult. The human services department is the area agency on aging for the entire county, and we rely on um, uh, senior centers, congregate meal programs, uh, different uh, of, of physical activities that bring people together and break social isolation for. Uh, for seniors and people with uh, living with disabilities. And <clears throat> with COVID, uh, we have not been able to uh, uh, bring as many people together in those environments. And so we've really focused on um, making sure that people have uh, the, the, the services that, that, that they need. Uh, the mayor spoke to uh, our, our um, efforts to combat hunger. That's incredibly critical. Uh, often uh, seniors and people living with disabilities uh, rely on congregate meal programs at senior centers and at other locations uh, for their primary meal. And uh, so we had to quickly shift to uh, away from a congregate meal uh, program to one of delivery uh, or where people could pick, pick up food um, for them in their household. Uh, we also, um, as the Area Agency on Aging, uh, we are responsible for ensuring that people's in-home care uh, is uh, provided, and uh, we've had to ensure that we're providing that level of care, level of service for individuals in their homes uh, in a different way. We want to make sure that people are safe, uh, both our um, home care workers as well as the individuals that they're caring for. Uh, and so we've uh, ensured that uh, 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 healthcare workers that go into the home have PPE, uh, as well as follow uh, uh, public health uh, guidelines and protocols uh, around hygiene um, so that they can go into the home and make sure that people have the services that they need. Um, we pay close attention to uh, the governor and the mayor uh, and, and to Director Hayes uh, so that we can um, understand when and if it might be safe to bring groups of people together, uh, even in a limited capacity. But at this point, uh, we're really encouraging people to stay home. And uh, as a result, trying to get as many of the services that they rely on in those congregate settings to them. Thank you, Jason. Uh, a question for Chris. Um, there have been several complaints against officers over the past month uh, or even over the weekend. Can you speak to what the policy or, or kind of timeline of addressing those complaints is given the different accountability systems that the city has. Sure, thanks Andres, I'll do my best. I'm not an expert on the 
discipline process, but my general understanding is uh, once a case is initiated with the Office of Police Accountability, they have 180 days um, to complete that case. And so that, that's the timeline by contractual uh, obligation with the various unions. So I think that's that's the, the deepest I can go into the explanation. You know, sometimes they resolve them faster if they're simple. And um, I know they're, they have a website, OPA does, where you can see the status if you know your case number. Um, they're also working and we're helping them and the Office of uh, Innovation and Performance and the mayor's office is working to do a, a better, more user-friendly public dashboard around that. Um, but for the time being, as they resolve them, those are posted, uh, if you know the case number, and, but they do have a, a time window of 180 days to complete their investigation once they're made aware of it. So that's generally what we're looking at. And if I got that wrong, I'm sure someone will correct me. Thank you. Uh, the next question may be for Chief Scoggins and, and, and also for you, Chris. Um, a lot of comments here talking about 911 response times and the 911 call center itself. Can you talk about a little bit about how that's funded and, and operated and how does the system of 911 call outs work? Chris, you want to lead and talk to the PD's portion, then I'll speak to fire. Yes, Chief, I'll, I'll let you handle the, the funding stuff because I know you've been on some of those uh, committees and you probably know that far better than I, but most the, the calls all come into the police department's uh, dispatch center and they, if it appears to be a fire call or a medical call, is a, a code, code dispatch where they, they call the chief's uh, dispatchers, who I believe are firefighters, um, and they assess whether they need to dispatch fire. The police stay on the line and listen and see if they need to have officers in route, um, you know, and to start classifying the call. They're, the call takers are recording the information as it happens. The call evolves as they learn more, and so they're updating it and changing the call type and the priority type, which affects how it gets sent out to the officers and what priority, you know, if it's a priority one, uh, in progress life safety, that could be lights and sirens going through intersections. If it's a priority three, something that happened a day or so ago and isn't urgent, they're going to get there if they're not on a priority one or priority two call. So they're listening to the call taker, they're asking them questions, and um, those are for the police department. Those are all civilians under civilian manager. We do have some sworn members in there who take police reports over the phone. And if there's are folks who can't for whatever reason be out in the field and who approve online reports due to uh, Washington law and city uh, ordinances, officers have to be the one who sign off on the final incident report of an official report. You know, if your car got broken into um, and but most of the call taking and dispatching is done by civilians who train specifically in that. And then they also then work with the fire department side of things, which I'll let the chief explain. Sure. Um, so the, the dispatch, the 911 center, it's made up of a primary answering point and a secondary answering point. All the 911 calls go through the primary answering point, it's called a PSAP. And in, in most communities around the country, that primary PSAP um, is generally a law enforcement agency. So when that dispatcher answers the phone, they'll, they'll, one of the questions they'll ask, is this a fire or medical emergency? If it is a fire or medical emergency, they immediately transfer the call to our fire dispatch center. And then we go through a series of triage questions to get our units out the door in a rapid manner. Our dispatch center is identified as a secondary PSAP, a secondary primary answering point. Everything that we do and how we're built is built on response times. As you can imagine, a medical emergency, we only have so much time to get there and the same thing with the fire emergency with the rate of spread the time temperature curve is what it's called on how fast a fire will spread if you can't get resources to try to, to try to slow that fire down that becomes very important so the two dispatch centers in the city primary answering point and secondary answering point. The dispatch centers are funded by a variety of sources. Everything from our city budget to, to county distribution and state dollars come in to make it to make up funding um, our dispatch center. So it's a very complicated process. It's not just one funding source where the dollars come from to actually support the 911 system. We also work in partnership 
with the other dispatch centers around the county. So for example, in the fire department, we communicate regularly with uh, NORCOM or Valleycom because if we need to have assistance from those fire and EMS agencies or they need assistance with us, then we all communicate in a rapid manner. So in, this is the Reader's Digest version. It's funded by multiple sources, uh, local government, county, and state funding, and there's multiple uh, dispatch centers here in the city of Seattle, just depending on the emergency. And you hear a lot about fire response times is because we need to get there in a rapid manner in case of a fire or a medical emergency. Thank you, Chief. Um, so, Thank you for uh, all your questions. I am uh, aware that uh, not everybody's uh, had their question answered. Uh, we are tracking these questions. As I mentioned, this uh, will be recorded and presented at the Seattle Channel in the next couple days and, and over uh, the mayor's social media. Um, you can get more information about uh, COVID-19 and the resources at the seattle.gov forward slash mayor forward slash COVID-19. Uh, there's also a website that the mayor has set up around rethinking policing, seattle.gov forward slash mayor forward slash rethinking dash policing. And uh, you can email any question that wasn't answered to jenny.durkin at seattle.gov. Um, the Department of Neighborhoods has by uh, every two weeks uh, a webinar um, uh, with addressing a lot of these similar issues around uh, COVID-19 response and reopening. Um, it's the second and fourth Friday of each month and it begins at 2.30 and the next one's gonna be on uh, August 14th. So uh, please go to uh, seattle.gov forward slash neighborhoods uh, for more information on that. Um, so you can join us and ask questions. Those agendas are driven by what the community wants to hear. And so if you have any questions as to what you want uh, addressed, uh, please uh, uh, email us as well. Thank you so much for your uh, time. Stay healthy and be well. Good evening.